Good afternoon, everyone. We're very pleased to have with us Jeffrey Feldman, who, as you know, for the last six years has been the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs. So it's a pleasure to have you for this briefing. Thank you, Farhan, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I feel like I've had sort of a month of goodbyes, um, and, but this is, this is the final one because I, I do leave the UN in just a couple of hours. Um, but the goodbyes I've had have been an opportunity for me to express my appreciation to, to member states, to civil society partners, um, to all of you for, for your interest in the multilateral affairs followed by the UN, and especially to my UN colleagues and others within the United Nations system with whom I've had the honor to work now for, it's nearly six years, not quite six years. Um, it's, been, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me. It's been an incredible honor. Um, I'm, often, I've, I'm often asked, you know, what's the difference between having served the, the U.S. government in my previous capacities in serving the United Nations today? Are there, are there significant differences? And there are significant differences. And the one that I find the most inspiring and the most important is that when we get together as the Department of Political Affairs um, in the morning to discuss the world's problems, it's the world that's sitting at the conference table, the backgrounds, the experience, the perspectives that people bring um, into the organization from so many different countries and so many, and so many different um, experiences is an incredibly rich and rewarding opportunity for me to really think about how the UN might play a role in, in various peace and security settings. Um, you all would have seen the announcement of my successor that the Secretary General gave last night, and of course he, he commented on it again today in his, in his press encounter on climate change. Um, I think Rosemary DiCarlo is an extremely talented and experienced diplomat, and she's a wonderful person. I'm, I'm very happy and pleased to be able to, to pass over the leadership of the Department of Political Affairs to someone for whom I have such respect. Um, and I am also grateful to the Secretary General for the confidence he has given me in his tenure, and, and, and also I'm grateful to Ban Ki-moon for having brought me into this organization and for having, um, having listened with such respect to the, to the ideas, to the analysis that the Department of Political Affairs put, put forward. Um, and as I've prepared to leave the United Nations in these, in these weeks, as I've talked to, to my staff and, and member states and others um, about the United Nations, reflecting on nearly six years of experience, I've spoken a lot about um, one particular development that's quite worrying. Now, when I look at the UN itself, I see three elements that are essential to the UN being effective. One is leadership. And I believe with, I am absolutely convinced with Secretary General Guterres that we have the leadership that this organization needs. And I was proud to serve under the leadership of Ban Ki-moon as well. So I think we have leadership. The second is the staff. It's been, as I said, it's been an honor and a, a thrill to work with such a diverse experienced, talented, dedicated staff who are working according to the principles of this organization. So I think we have staff. The third part is the one that concerns me, which is, the, which is it's essential for the United Nations to be effective that we continue to attract and have member state support for the multilateral system, for the institution, for the organization itself. The world is facing unprecedented challenges right now. Look at the complex problems that, that various governments are trying to deal with. Um, the, you can talk about, uh, about terrorism, the impact of climate change, such as the Secretary General outlined, outlined earlier today, cyber crimes, um, attacks on infrastructure and so forth. The list of complex challenges that, that member states face today are enormous, and I, and I believe that they would be much um, more effectively um, addressed through a multilateral system. I think that, that you have complex challenges facing member states, and you need the, the type of multilateral international um, solution to these. But at the same time that we have this phenomenon, um, we also see an increasing number of, of leaders, increasing number of 
countries that are questioning whether the multilateral system that this organization represents um, is the right way forward, is the, um, is the answer to these things. And, and frankly, if, you, if, if a leader is not committed to rule of law in his or her own country, how committed would we expect that leader to be to the United Nations, to the United Nations itself? Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why I told my staff in, our, in the meetings that I've been having with them on the farewell, um, the Secretary General's reform agenda is important to make this organization more effective, important to make this organization more transparent, important to show member states that this organization can evolve to address today's, um, today's challenges. But I, am, but I do leave here concerned about making sure that we maintain, in addition to the excellent leadership we have, in addition to the excellent staff we have, that we maintain member state support. Um, the other thing I, I, I will I will mention again, we might come up with a thing, is that is the, in the questions and answers, is the, the trip to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, where the Secretary General deployed me back, back in December. That came at a time of high tensions, and, I, and, and my DPRK interlocutors agreed with me that we were, that we were living through one of the more dangerous uh, peace and security situations in the world at that moment. Um, I, I don't want to claim a bigger role for the United Nations um, than it actually had in the relative thaw since then. Um, but I do think that the confidence and trust in the UN that, that the parties have demonstrated and all that represents is further evidence of why we do need to keep the multilateral system um, strong, why we need the rules-based based system. Obviously, you all cover the UN every day. You know that this, you know that the that the UN system is, is is far from perfect, and I think Syria remains perhaps the most tragic example of the failure of the international community, uh, member state bodies um, included, to uh, um, address a peace and security, humanitarian, human rights catastrophe. But that failure in Syria is just more of a reason for us to recommit ourselves to pursue peace, peace and justice with even more determination and holding those responsible for crimes accountable. As I, as I said at the beginning, it has been a singular honor to serve this, this organization. And I now look forward to hearing your questions or comments. Thanks. I will now have a, a last round of questions. With that. Hi, Mr. Feldman. On behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, welcome and farewell. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to start again with you having visited North Korea, as you brought it up. Um, seeing now what's happening, the latest developments, uh, there is a summit agreed between the South and the North. Um, there's a possible meeting between Kim Jong-un and President Donald Trump. Uh, how optimistic, you sound very optimistic, the Secretary General as well, but how optimistic that a real and implementable agreement uh, will be reached? And how much do you think your visit actually set the wheels in motion? You know, I don't know how much my, my visit set the wheels in motion. I, I hope that we were able to con to contribute to the relative thaw that we've seen. We certainly made the made the points when we were there of the importance of reopening channels um, with with South Korea, with the Republic of Korea, the importance of signaling to the United States that um, it was time to start moving away from from a more confrontational approach toward talks. Um, we certainly uh, made the point about the need to try to seize the Olympics as a window and you know there's lots of things that we that we that we encouraged the the DPRK host to think about but how much how much our talking points played into this I, I simply don't know um, I think it is I think it's important to manage expectations the issues are extremely complicated um, on how what does peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula mean what would that entail? But in general, let's look back. Remember back in September at the General Assembly, there had just been the sixth nuclear test by the DPRK as the world leaders were gathered here in New York for the General Assembly in September. That was one of the top topics everyone was talking about. People were talking, people, world leaders from all over, all over 
were talking with great concern and alarm about that sixth nuclear test. People were concerned about, about nuclear proliferation. Then in November 29th, there was the ICBM launch from North Korea. Tensions were extremely high. It's now been four months since there's been any kind of, of military test like this. That's not the same as denuclearization. Um, but it, it means that instead of having tensions continue to rise to at an alarming pace leading to who knows what, instead we have um, a scenario by which various parties are, tr are talking about getting together um, at various levels to see if there's a way forward that would be consistent with the Security Council resolution's calls for peaceful denuclearization, that would be consistent with the international community's goals for, for nuclear nonproliferation, and that would address security concerns in, in Northeast Asia. So I think that we are inherently in a better spot than we were just a few months ago. Um, but I would expect that to really address these issues effectively, one is going to have to have a fairly lengthy process that, that derives from the summit meetings that are in discussion. So I would, I would hope that people would see the summit meetings as the start of a process that would lead to the implementation of the Security Council resolutions. Thank you, sir, for this briefing today. And my name is Oscar Bolanos from OMB Latino America. And my question is the process of elections in Venezuela. And how do you see this process coming now on May? And the other is about the summit of the Americas in Lima, Peru is going to happen soon and now in April, where President Maduro is being banned to attend this meeting. And also, of course, the, uh, President Trump is coming to attend the, the summit. Look, election, elections are national processes. The, the UN um, considers requests from um, member states to work with their election authorities to improve, the, to try to improve the integrity, the technical merits of the of the elections. So we we work in about it's it's UNDP and DPA together work in work in about 50 countries a year. Um, for the improvement or to enhance the technical capacity of, ele of elections. We're not working in Venezuela on technical capacity of elections in, the, in, the, in that way. The UN doesn't, does not tend to do observation of elections. It's rare where the UN does observation of elections. You could, um, we had a Security Council mandate a few years ago for election, monitor, election observation in, in Burundi, and that's the last time, and, and that was the first time since, what, 2001 or something when, with Cote d'Ivoire, 2003 or 2004, something like that. Um, so we're not directly involved in the elections in Venezuela. They're, they are a national process. Um, the, we have, of course, had discussions with, with Venezuelan authorities. We've had discussions with, we've met with opposition figures to talk about um, the political environment in Venezuela, but, we're, but we don't tend to pass judgment on, on national governments, member states, own electoral systems. And on the, on the America Summit, of course, that's, uh, we are a universal body. Um, the United Nations represents all the member states that, that are in it, and I, and I would think you, it would be better to ask others about, about the Latin American Summit than, than the United Nations. Masoud? Okay. Thank you. My name is Masoud Ezra. I represent Daily Dawn newspaper of Pakistan. Um, Mr. Feldman, and I know that you're going, you should be having a little bit of trepidation, being, being that uh, the President of the United States, who was here uh, last year, called uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, the ruler of uh, uh, North Korea, little rocket man, and all that. So, and then also there was a one permanent United Nations until Kofi Annan had a permanent ambassador to United uh, to North Korea that has been removed. Do you think? Do you think that uh, appointing a permanent ambassador of United Nations to North Korea will help? Do you think the tensions will be lowered? Do you th how far do you think the rhetoric should be lowered to 
what you call to start these negotiations again, because if they're going to meet in May, this has to be lowered. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the, the UN does have a presence on the ground in Pyongyang. Um, the UN country, there's a UN resident representative, there's a UN country team that includes um, age, uh, some of the agency's funds and programs like, like um, the UNDP. So the UN does have a presence on the ground in, in Pyongyang and has maintained it over the years. Um, in terms of what is our role in the negotiating process, if that's, if that's more, the, more the question, we think that we have some things to offer. You know, the, the UN stands for the impartiality. The UN offers a voice and principles for peaceful resolution of conflict. The UN offers channels. Um, all, you know, all of, the, relative, all of the, the relevant parties are members of this organization, so we have channels where we can, where we can um, pass communications to any of them. Um, I think that we can contribute to building the right type of atmosphere for constructive negotiations between the parties. We can help bridge differences. We can, we can um, try to help produce some confidence building. I don't believe we're going to be invited into these summit meetings between North and South Korea, between, between the United States um, and, and the DPRK. Um, we, don't, we don't expect that, but I think that we can play a useful role um, in creating the type of atmosphere that, that, would, that would enhance the likelihood that these, that these summit meetings will lead to success. But, sir, the oh, fact that the, the former, former... We, we, we uh, have a lot of hands up in there, so, so let's move, move this around. Uh, Evelyn? Thank you very much, and I'm so sorry you're leaving. Evelyn Leopold. Um, how do you see the Iran nuclear deal uh, evolving. You know what President Trump wants to do, but there are other things in the works. How do you see that, uh, uh, the outcome of that? Or the up to it? I mean, we hope, Evelyn, we would hope that there would, that there would be a maintenance of, of international unity vis-a-vis -vis the applicability of, of Resolution 2231. 2231 is the resolution that incorporated the JCPOA into a Security Council resolution that turned the JCPOA from, from a, a six-party agreement into international law. Um, so we would hope that there would, be, that there would be a maintenance of the international unity behind that resolution. I mean, when I went to Pyongyang, I had as one of the strongest messages um, for the North Koreans who I, who I met the unity of the Security Council. Um, the, whenever the North Korean officials would talk about Washington as if that's their only, as if Washington was the only problem they had, I was able to cite the Security Council resolutions that have been passed unanimously to say to the North Korean leadership, no, your problem is not just with Washington. Your problem is that the world is concerned about, about the nuclear nonproliferation. The world is concerned about the defiance of the international will. And so, this, so the unity of the Security Council on these peace and security issues is really, really important to any of our ability to influence, to influence thinking, to try to move things in the right direction. So I would, I would very much regret if that unity behind 2231 was going to um, be broken. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coast for Access. Thanks for doing this exit, uh, uh, exit press conference. I wanted to ask you about a, a, a conflict that seems to have actually gotten worse in the last year, either despite or some would some say because of UN involvement, and it's the one in Cameroon between the central government and the Anglophone areas. Um, seems like you know they turned off the internet. Now, recent, more recently, they've been burning down whole villages. I know that Mr. Fall had gone there. And at least, at least I heard him say that you know anyone that wants secession is an extremist, which is something that the government uses to actually perform these acts and say that anyone that says that is a terrorist. So I wanted to know, like, how this is a it's a lesser known or less high, less high profile conflict, but how does DPA? You said you have all this expertise from around the world, but is it possible that sort of the the former or even current colonial powers have kind of the ear in some cases of, of these kind of a conflicts? And how would you assess? the UN's performance in Cameroon. And, I, and just one footnote on North Korea. Since there was a lot of questions in this room about the junior professional officer that was, was hired, and it may be, I think Dessa, had, the, 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 the Under Secretary General of Dessa had said that every country has a right to, to a JPO, which may be the case. At least some have said that, the, 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 that this Mr. Kim Joo-song 
is the son of a Workers' Party official. Is it the case that, that, that DPA would have to take any, uh, uh, any individual put forward by a country to be a JPO, no matter even, uh, or did you have some discretion? Thanks a lot. Um, th thank you, Mr. Lee. It's worth keeping in mind that, the Depar that by and large, the Department of Political Affairs um, operates overseas under Chapter 6 of the Charter. That means member state consent. We operate, with, we operate in Chapter 8 in partnerships with regional and sub-regional organizations that are, that are key to our ability to have full understanding and better credibility in our work, but it's Chapter 6. This is not something where the, where the Department of Political Affairs can say, hey, we see a problem, we're going to go, we're going to send out a, a team or an envoy or something like that. That's not how it works. We have to have the type, we have to be able to um, persuade a country that some outside um, engagement, some outside facilitation might be of use. And that's hard. This is one of the hardest things that I have seen about working in the Department of Political Affairs, and it's one of the hardest things about making prevention work. The Secretary General is, as you've all heard, is very keen on, on prevention across the whole spectrum of UN activities, whether it's prevention of childhood disease or prevention of conflict, but prevention of conflict is especially difficult. And I would put Cameron in this category. Um, because we think that there, that there are lessons learned, there are best practices, there are examples in other parts of the world where there have been successful processes that address the concerns of minorities, of, of various ethnic groups, of people who feel for one reason or the other disenfranchised that might be useful in Cameroon. But we're not going to be able to just march in there and say, this is what you got to do. That's not the idea, and it's not realistic. Um, and so we have a, a sort of an ongoing dialogue with the Cameroon authorities about our concerns over, what it, over problems in the Anglophone region and what could happen if those if those concerns aren't addressed effectively, but this is this is not the case of the UN being able to go in and saying this is the solution. Even if we ha even when the door is open to UN intervention on conflict prevention under Chapter Six, I don't believe it's wise for the UN to say this is the solution. What the UN should be doing is helping local actors come up with a way forward that addresses grievances in a way that the local owners end up having ownership in that. I think the Cameroon, the Cameroon is something you're going to, you, you, we, we need to keep watching. Um, on JPOs, I'm, I, I don't know all the details of the recruitment, as, you, um, as one might imagine. If you're undersecretary general of a department, you don't, you're not really following each and, each and every um, recruitment. It's normally, it's normally done through, a, the JPO process is normally done through a competitive process when a country comes in and says um, that they would like to place a JPO. We, we, have, we, have, asked, we have asked for JPOs um, in various parts, of, various parts of, of DPA, and we do ask member states to put forth multiple candidates. I don't know the family background of the JPO um, that we have from, from the DPRK. I've only met the JPO once at some, at some DPA event, and we shook hands, and I said, hello, welcome. That's, that's all my personal knowledge is. Carol? Uh, uh, Joseph Klein, candidate no, no, free. No, Carol. Hi, Mr. Carol. Feldman, hi. Um, I want to come back to your comments, your interesting comments about countries uh, not supporting the UN, walking away from multilateralism. And clearly, we have in mind the United States on that front. You made the argument that on North Korea, the United Nations was useful to the U.S. administration in, in addressing that conflict. So going forward, how concerned are you about the state of uh, U.S.-U.N. relations? Um, in, in how do you see that, that disengagement playing out? I mean, I, I can. I, you know, I'm in a unique. I'm in a unique position to answer your question, Carol, because I am a U.S. citizen, high level, who has a, a relatively high level position inside the U.N. Secretariat, and if, and in leaving the United Nations after nearly six years, I firmly believe that the United Nations is a force multiplier. Um, 
it, um, for interests that are not only American interests, but are interests of what I would say is the broad global community. Um, and I believe that the, that the um, consensus that one can get ideally in UN action provides legitimacy to addressing, addressing global concerns, you know, cyber crimes, terrorism, um, development needs, whatever you, what have you, a legitimacy that exceeds the legitimacy that any one member state can, can bring. Um, so I, I leave here knowing that this, is a, that this organization is not perfect, no organization is, knowing that, um, that there are a lot of things that the UN needs to improve, as the Secretary General himself will, uh, will say, and as his reform program indicates. But overall, thinking that um, this is a force multiplier for issues in which the U.S. and others have, have interests. Um, I think that the, secret the, the Secretary General in his first 15 months has done a very good job of maintaining positive relations with, with not only with the United States, but with, with key members across the board of this, or of this organization. So I, I, his leadership, I think, um, provides a certain level of confidence that member states have, have in the organization. But there is a problem when you have so many um, global leaders, and it's not simply the United States, but many global leaders who, who are questioning whether or not the international system that's been set up over seven, eight decades of careful negotiations really is addressing their national interests. Clearly, leaders will put their national interests first. And so we in the UN have an obligation to try to do a, um, a better job of being transparent in what we're doing and explain why it is, it is in their national interest to keep supporting this organization. There's a lot of UN speak inside the house that someone coming in off the street of, of Jakarta or, or Kansas City or what, whatever city would have no idea what we're talking about. We need to be able to make the case of why member states should see it in their national interest to keep strong support for the United Nations. And again, I believe that we have a, a leader and secretary general who is a good communicator along those lines. For us. I wanted to, hi, Mr. Feldman, hi. thank you for the briefing. I wanted to go back to Syria. You said that it was um, sort of the failure of the international community. And how, how do you see this conflict getting resolved? Do you think that the that the political process will come back to the UN and ultimately be resolved um, in a UN umbrella, or do you see this uh, mainly uh, an issue between US and Russia and Iran? Uh, where do we go? How do we get out of this um, deadlock? I, mean, I, think that, I think that the Syria crisis it epitomizes um, the worst of how a local conflict doesn't stay local. In this day and age, I mean, I mean, the Syria crisis started out as a local, as a local political issue, um, and there's spillover out of Syria into the region. You see a political impact even in Europe of the of the, that emanated from the migration that came from the, the that came in large part from the Syria crisis, and you see national, regional, and international actors all interfering are all being involved one or the other inside Syria. So, so you have Syria affecting, affecting countries and regions outward, and you have countries and regions affecting Syria inward. It's, a, it's, it's awful. But the, but the basic conflict started at the local level for political issues. I do not believe that we will have a sustainable solution for the Syria crisis until there is a political solution that addresses um, the, the root causes of this conflict to begin with. And we also have to have accountability at this point. There's been, there have been too many um, war crimes, there's been too many people killed, there's been too many gro gross, grotesque human rights violations to expect that, that you would have a sustainable peace if there's complete impunity for all this. So I think you need um, some kind of accountability and you need some kind of political solution if you're gonna, if you're gonna end the Syria crisis once and for all. Um, we're ready. You know, the, you've heard Stefan de Mistura talk about um, the constitutional work that would, that would, that would allow um, Syrians from across the civil society and political spectrum to start talking about the kinds of Syria they want. At, the big, at, the, at the, the, broad question, the big question, there's a lot of agreement already about the non-sectarian nature of the state, things like that. 
Um, but they have to start getting down to work. And frankly, on that, it's, the government has been very reluctant to send interlocutors who are ready to engage seriously on the, on the political issues rather than simply deliver polemics. Netta? Thank you, Mr. Feltman. Uh, back Hi. here, Netta Shafiq with the BBC. Hi. I wondered after you know, meeting with North Korean officials, if you came away with some suggestions, ideas of what North Korea would need, what securities they would want um, in order to even begin thinking about denuclearization. There has to be something rooted in rooted in the broader in the broader region that would reinforce anything that comes out of these summits, and it's one reason why I think I I frankly am so, I'm in without knowing the details of the trip I'm encouraged by by the by um, the North Korean leaders' trip to Beijing because I we've seen the essential role that China plays you know China um, being part of the Security Council and adopting sanctions, China then enforcing the sanctions that, that were adopted, I think had, a, had an impact on how North Korea looked at its own um, political strategies going forward. So I think having China be part of this, part of this picture um, is, very, is helpful um, in terms of guaranteeing the implementation of whatever outcome m might take place. The, you know, Asia doesn't have the overlapping um, security, political, networks that other parts of the world do. You don't have you don't have anything like the EU, NATO, OSCE in the same with the same institutional strength that you have in say in, in say Europe. Um, so I think that there probably will have to be some kind of, of broader regional buy-in. Obviously the six party talks were the framework for a long time. But I didn't I don't have any specific ideas at this at this point. But I think that the China Chinese role is extremely important. Is extremely important, as we've seen in the passage and enforcement of sanctions. Ali, thank you, Mr. Feldman. Ali Barada from Ashat al Ausat newspaper and from France 24. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, how do you uh, characterize Iran's role in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Bahrain, and in the whole region? And what shall be done? to avert um, um, a potential catastrophe in the region in, in light of the possible US, uh, US withdrawal from the uh, uh, nuclear uh, agreement with, uh, with Iran. Uh, and I have a personal interest in, uh, in your insights regarding um, the sophisticated relationship that you ha you've had with the press in the light of, uh, of the fake news and all what has been said uh, with regards to news nowadays, how do you uh, see the future of the press in the global um, uh, politics? Thank you. Well, Ali, on your, second, on your second question, I don't know that I have a sophisticated relationship. I've tried to avoid the press as much as I can. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I, 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 at a personal level, am not, am not very comfortable with public speaking and, and, me, and speaking before the media. At more, of, at more of a professional level, I believe that DPA is most effective when DPA is quiet, and you may not agree with that. But I think that, but when I talked about member state consent earlier, member states are not going to give DPA um, an open door to come in and help work with them on local political issues if they think that DPA is simply going to turn around and start talking to the media or talking to the Security Council about what we're doing. So I, no, I, no, I think that the media plays an extremely important role. And I think that, and I, and it's something where, where I think we in the UN have to have to balance, and DPA in particular, we have to balance our interest in developing a relationship, a non-threatening relationship with local actors, which often requires not going to the media, not going to the Security Council, with the need to be transparent about what we're doing, so member states still support us. And maybe my, maybe I have erred too much on the silent side. From probably from your perspective, I have, but it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act because I, because we we do not want to close off channels because governments are afraid that we're going to start shining this bright media security council spotlight on what they would see as a domestic issue. 
Um, so that that explains the professional reasons why I've probably not seen you as often as, certainly as often as Jose Luis would like me to see you. Um, but I think that the, the media role is, is, I think the media role is essential to push back against this fake news story. I don't think it's enough. I think leaders have to get behind the idea that truth still matters. Um, it can't just, it, the media itself plays an essential role, but it's not the only role that needs to be played to push back against the fake news, pheno fake news phenomenon. We, all of us who work for institutions that um, can, can be under threat from fake news have a responsibility, as I said before, to speak in words, to speak in ways that people can understand us. Um, on Iran, I, broad, I'm going to broaden the, the, the question a little bit, Ali. Um, there, I, there are many times, not only in the six years that I've had the honor to serve the UN, but in the, you know, 30-some years I've been involved one way or the other in diplomacy, national service, and to combine. You know, I've seen many examples where a state has inadvertently opened the door to interference from others by not addressing grievances, by um, by creating the type of situation where another country can jump in, and I'll take take I'll take your your home country of Lebanon as an example. Um, would Hezbollah have been able to put its roots so deep into this Lebanese society had the confessional arrangements of Lebanon really provided the type of equality in terms of education, social mobility, um, status to all the communities of Lebanon. I, I truly believe that Hezbollah was able to set down roots, not simply because they had Iranian backing and Iranian money, but because there were, there were legitimate grievances inside Lebanon that were left unaddressed for a very long time. And so I, I think that the first thing one wants to do if one wants to stop a, another country from interfering is don't create the opportunities, don't create the openings for that country to go in. I mean, look, look at the Yemen war. Look at the Yemen war. Iranian influence, we can argue over how deep it is, how big it is, how lasting it is, but Iranian influence, I think without question, is far greater in, the Lebanon, in, in, in Yemen today than it was before the war started. Look at, you know, I can take something from, you know, from my own country, from my own national background. Look at Iraq. I think we can all say that the, that the Iranian influence inside Iraq is far greater today than it was before 2003. So I think the first thing you want to do if you're worried about the Iranian influence is don't create the opportunities for them to exploit. Mr. Sato. Thank you. My name is Taka Sato from NHK. Uh, I remember the, at the previous uh, press conference, uh, the, you said that your visit on DPRK is not evaluated now, but in the future. So looking back to your visit to the North, uh, DPRK, did you have any uh, anticipation of the, the possible change of the DPRK's attitude in the future? Uh, if your answer is yes, what makes, uh, what makes you say so? Uh, the answer, if answer is no, what, uh, what factor uh, do you think uh, made the DPRK leadership change the course? When I, when I left Pyongyang on this, you know, December 9th, um, I had no idea what the impact of our own interventions with the DPRK officials would, um, would have. And I still don't know what, what impact the interventions we had, um, the interventions that we made had on, on North Korea's leadership decisions. But I am convinced that our points would have been reported upwards. We, there had not been a sustained political engagement by the United Nations with DPRK officials for nearly eight years. Yes, we had seen um, um, officials who had come to the General Assembly, and of course, Ambassador um, 
Jocelyn Nam comes to see me regularly, the, the, the DPRK permit representative, but in terms of a, of a high level engagement in Pyongyang, it had been almost eight years since the UN had done that, despite the fact that this is one of the, or probably a key, uh, the key peace and security challenge that the, that the world faces. Um, and, and we had lots of time. I think I, I, to, I told you all, we had hours and hours of discussions. We were making the point that there's a high risk of an accidental war. There's a high risk of miscalculation that could be, a, that could be catastrophic, that you need, to, that you need to open these channels of communi communication. You need to start taking seriously the Security Council resolutions and the unanimity that the international community has. So we had plenty of time. They were generous with their time in letting me explain why what our positions were, why we had those positions, what we thought the, the risks were if they, if they didn't, if they, if they didn't um, look in a different direction. Um, and I don't think that they, that, that they would have spent so much time with us and not reported what we said. So I suspect that what we said was, was part of the calculations that the leadership um, took into account, but I don't know how much influence we had. I, I still don't. Abdelhamid? Thank you. My name is Abdelhamid Sayam in Jarida Al Quds Al Arabi. Ahlan wa sahlan. And yani, uh, we wish you the best of luck for the, your uh, next stage in life. My question, Mr. Feldman, as you are an expert on the Middle East, you served there and you've been here, the USG for political affairs. Honestly, I want to get your opinion about the viability of the two-state solution. Is it still truly, I mean, in your opinion, knowing the region, knowing the confiscation of land, knowing the expansion of settlement, and the Israeli uh, arrogance now with the support of uh, the Trump administration after the resolution on Jerusalem and move, deciding to move the embassy to Jerusalem and the... Uh, all the other steps, including cutting off the aids on, on UNRWA and the Palestinian Authority. Is there a possibility of a two-state solution, in your opinion? I think the best argument for the two-state solution um, is looking at what the other options are. That you look at, you look at, you look at the at any other option, um, one state, uh, one state option where the the the. Israeli Jews would feel um, sort of an existential threat. You look at apartheid, which is unsustainable over the long term. If you look at any other solution, it doesn't work at all. So I think you, the two-state solution remains the viable one by process of elimination. It doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean that the leaders are taking the right steps to make the two-state solution come closer. Um, I believe there have been a lot of very damaging steps toward, um, toward the two-state solution. But, I, but do I still believe it's viable? Yes, because I can't see any other, any other way forward. Say me? Okay, Benny Avni. Um, you said before that uh, you need to uh, convince member states of the necessity of the UN. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, so convince me. Um, there has been uh, several diplomats have told us in recent days, sort of erosion of compliance with Security Council resolutions, the Security Council being the top uh, political body in the world. Uh, would you ascribe this to? Do you think it's, it, it hurts the credibility of the UN to resolve issues, and, and how do you fix it? Of course I'm concerned about this, Benny. Um, there's there's been an erosion of there's been an erosion of compliance with Security Council resolutions. There's been there's been a serious erosion of compliance with international humanitarian law. Uh, I mean, the Syria conflict is example A of this. You know, 20, 2401 was passed several weeks ago, and there's still not a ceasefire. 2401 called for called for ceasefire in Syria. There's still not a ceasefire. We're still worried about trying to get civilians out of Douma, and most of what was then the Eastern Ghouta, um con conclave has been has been um, overtaken by military force. You look at the Look at chemical weapons, or allegations of chemical weapons use in Syria. I'm not an investigator, but allegations of chemical weapons use. These were shocking several years ago when these first came out. And now they're just sort of like, okay, well, there's, more, there's yet more allegations of chemical weapons use. The Security Council hasn't been able to pass a resolution on accountability. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm very, very concerned about this. Now, if you look at the Security Council's 
you know, order of business, if you look at their agenda, if you look at their, their work products, they still agree on more things than they don't agree on. The number of resolutions passed is far greater than the number of resolutions that um, didn't pass or, or were un in draft but never even put to, put to blue. But the ones that are passed don't tend to have the same importance of some of those like accountability for chemical weapons that never, that never came to fruition. And again, it's why I'm so concerned about maintaining the international unity on the key peace and security issues such as nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation for the Korean Peninsula and, frankly, one that you and I probably disagree on, 2231. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Uh, uh Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. I'd like to ask about the Cyprus dispute. The UN-backed efforts failed to resolve the decades-long uh, dispute on the island, and the recent gas exploration in the Mediterranean has increased tension between the two sides. Uh, do you think that uh, if the two sides were to come together to start talks, uh, the gas exploration should be set aside? And do you also uh, believe uh, whether there is any other solution rather than the reunification of the island? Thank you. The, you know, the Security Council has recently, I, I, I'm sorry I can't cite the number, but the Security Council has again pronounced itself on this question. Um, which is that the, the goal is a bicommunal, uh, um, bizonal federation of political equality. And so that would be the mandate that, that the UN would have in trying to look for, in trying to help the parties achieve a political solution. But I have to recognize that there's great distrust right now, that there's been a loss of confidence um, between the two sides because of the collapse of the talks in Kranz, Montana. And, and I believe it's gonna, it, it will take um, some bold leadership steps to, re to start to restore the type of confidence that, that each side needs in the other for us to move forward again toward um, any type of viable, sustainable negotiations. But again, the goal is defined right now by the Security Council um, is the same as the goal has been by communal, by zonal um, federation of, of political equality. Um, the, I think the two sides have agreed that that the, the resources, the offshore resources, um, should benefit the population of the island as a whole. These are long-term goals, obviously, and in the short term, we have tensions to address, and we have to find ways to rebuild the confidence to get back to negotiations. Thanks, Mr. Feltman. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, during your time here, you've seen a lot of developments in Myanmar. Um, how concerned are you about which way the country is now heading? And the GA asked the UN to appoint a special advisor in December and we, we haven't seen one appointed yet. It seems like no one wants the job. And just on a personal note, what's next for you? Yeah, <laughs> is that the job for you? <laughs> um, on the last, what's next, what's next, what's next for me is maybe a little less international travel right now. Um, I, I, I need to look at options, I truly don't know. I haven't, somehow, up until even a couple of hours, or well, until an hour ago, I was still clearing papers, so I haven't had time to even put my CV together. Um, we remain very concerned about Myanmar, and I think the Secretary General himself just spoke on the, on the, uh, the challenge of finding the right envoy um, when, he, when he saw you all after the climate change um, press encounter that we we do have the mandate from the from the General Assembly and it was backed by a presidential statement from the Security Council as well for for a special envoy for the Secretary General to appoint a special envoy but we still have we also have that we want we want to take into account the Chapter Six member state consent um, principle because we would like that special envoy to have access to the leadership circles in, in Naypyidaw because the person is going to need to work with the leadership circles in Naypyidaw to, if, if he or she will have any impact. So it is a challenge to find the, to find the right profile that can, be, that can represent the principles of this organization, that can address the real humanitarian reconciliation and security challenges, um, and who will be able to talk, have credibility, talk with the local officials, so it's a challenge. Um, we're very concerned about, me, about Myanmar at many, at many levels right now. And, uh, the Secretary General, I, I 
I think also talked about the the Rohingya in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has been has been generous with its hospitality. Um, the world that we think has an obligation to help Bangladesh, but you've got 150,000 people right now um, who are probably at real risk from the mon from the upcoming monsoons. I mean, I mean, all of them will be affected by this, but there's 150,000 in acute need. Um, we estimate because of the monsoon. So that's one that's one area of concern. Um, there's also the the issue of how do you promote safe, sustainable, dignified returns to northern Rakhine when the infrastructure has doesn't exist for that. And I'm not talking just about the physical infrastructure, which is important, but the infrastructure of non-discriminatory um, security. What, what, how do you do policing? How do you overcome the fears that the Rohingya would have that they would be subjected to the same sort of treatment again? How do you overcome the fear of the of the other population of Rakhine, the Rakhine Buddhists, about any kind of revenge or terrorism. Um, how do you how do you overcome the ethnic the I mean it's ethnic hatred in some um, and so we we don't yet see the foundations in place for the the safe, sustained, dignified, voluntary return to their places of origin or places of place of choice. I will say that we've had some we've had a series of constructive conversations um, with the government in Naypyidaw, uh, UNDP, UNHCR have had a um, more a more promising um, working relationship lately. But we'll see where this goes. There's also, of course, a much larger picture, which is the overall peace process in, in Myanmar that that goes well beyond. Um, the problems we've, the problems that have grabbed grabbed our headlines and have such humanitarian implications in, in northern Rakhine, but there's the overall peace process and the national and the national ceasefire accord and and the expectation by those that signed the national ceasefire accord of certain political initiatives going forward that that this part of the Myanmar portfolio also can't be neglected. It's been nearly an hour, so I'm going to try and cluster yeah. four yeah, questions yeah. together and, and then let's see three. what. Yeah. Uh, so keep it quick. Uh, so it'll go Ben, Frank, then, then you, and then James. And uh, so quickly ask your questions one after the other, and then we'll try to uh, answer them en masse. Uh, ben Ivansky, Fox News. A couple of quick, quick questions. What did you, when you mentioned apartheid, uh, when you were talking about two state solution, what were you actually saying there? And secondly, on DPRK. Uh, do you believe the Trump administration deserves credit in bringing Kim to the table? Frank? Uh, I can't uh, hear you. Yeah, uh, uh, Frank Uciardo, TRT World News. I want to ask you a question regarding your comments of a two-state solution. Do you believe that uh, that can really happen if any one country claims Jerusalem as its capital? Uh, yeah, I wanted to know, uh, what advice would you give your successor, Rosemary De Carlo? James Bay's Al Jazeera. Um, I, you said earlier on that uh, we, you hope the process would emerge from the summits. In some ways, that seems a rather unusual way round. What do you think are the pitfalls of this approach? If these, you're relying on two summit meetings, one of them not yet scheduled, involving the President of the United States and the leader of North Korea, both somewhat unpredictable characters. Is there, does it make it particularly high stakes, these meetings? Um, I, on, for the Fox News story, the Fox News questions. Um, I don't think that you have a sustainable solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if one side is, is disenfranchised, if, if there's one set of laws for one, for, for one type of person, another set of laws for another type of person. That's the basic, that's the basic concern I have um, that, that, again, sends me back to the fact that the two-state solution remains the only, the only viable one because I don't think that, you know, Israelis, Israel's a very strong, healthy democracy. I don't think that Israelis want to see um, a, a permanent system by which um, their neighbors um, have a different set of uh, operate under a different set of, of voting rights, etc. Um, on DPRK, I think that this really is a example of successful diplomacy by 
Washington, by the other countries on this, by the other P5 countries, to maintain that type of Security Council unity, that and that maintains the type of pressure that the sanctions, the growing implementation of sanctions represents. Um, the sanctions, the sanctions, as I said, are more than simply um, a a punitive measure against North Korea for its defiance of international law. They're the symbol of the international unity, and it's a, it's an example to me of why the multi of of why the multilateral system, when it works, is a force multiplier. Um, this is not soft stuff. This is, this is hard diplomacy that is designed to have an impact, and it works when the international community is together, which in the case of nuclear nonproliferation, the world does tend to be together because they recognize the, the, the real risks. Um, you know, on, Jer on Jerusalem, we as the, as the United Nations um, believe that the final status is something to be negotiated in the par uh, by the parties, and we understand that the aspirations of the Palestinians are also to have a capital in, in Jerusalem. And we would welcome the type of process where these issues can be, can be discussed between the parties that we would be, we'd be happy to facil facilitate. In terms of, of my successor, someone I've known and respected for a number of years, I would tell her that, again, I think that we have three, three issues that we have to deal with to make sure the UN stays strong. Leadership, which we have. Good staff, which, which by and large we have. There's always, there's always a, you know, a few bad eggs in any bureaucracy, but we have, but we have, we have extremely good staff. And third is that member state support. So she needs to work in my view, on that third element. Um, and to get member state support, we need, to, we need to, again, be transparent. We need to show that we can be effective. Um, and we, ne we need to um, maintain positive relations. You know, I've met with, I have been meeting with member states, um, well, I mean, basically, I've been very accessible to member states for, for my whole time, but, and particularly over the past few weeks to sort of do lessons learned thinking with the idea of providing Briefing to my successor over how member states see us right see us right now. The I mean it, it is unusual in, in an issue as complicated as nuclear nonproliferation, the the security issues of Northeast Asia, DPRK's defiance of the international community in terms of its its um, military program to start with the summit. Um, but again, look back to where we were in September and November. Think about how high, high, how high those tensions were in September and November. Think about the what seemed to be almost a regular pace of North Korea doing the type of military launches, um, nuclear testing that advanced its program um, and that put the world on edge. The fact that we're talking about summits now instead may be unusual, but it has suspended the type of tests that um, could have advanced the nuclear and missile program that are illegal under international law. So I look at this as something that is, in the short term, inherently good. It lowers tensions. It prevents the, it prevents the nuclear and missile tests. In the longer term, I think we need to manage expectations about how complicated the issues will be to resolve. And so I hope that this, this unusual reversal of summit first, process later, will turn out to be promising. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks. Uh, and thanks also for giving so much time. I'm, I'm sorry if it, if it went, for, no, if no, it went fine, away. Well. But now I gotta run. Yeah. Thanks.